I'm Phyllis Bennis. I'm a fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies, and my latest book is called Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror. It's, it's somehow become standard knowledge, which is one of those things that everybody knows, which isn't true, but everyone knows, that elections are not won and lost on issues of peace and war. In fact, we know that's not true. In 2008, the single biggest reason that Barack Obama was elected was because he said, this is a dumb war and I won't continue dumb wars. Of course, he also said he would escalate the war in Afghanistan, and he did. Uh, but that was, you know, that was motivating people in a really profound way. Much of our foreign policy these days, and many of our wars right now, are designed in a way to disguise their reality from ordinary people. The divide between military people and the rest of our population has grown wider and wider. It's not only about the draft. It's partly about the draft. The draft meant everybody had to think about it. Rich white people didn't get drafted very much, but they had to at least think about what it meant and what they were going to do to get around it. Without a draft, you don't have that. But you also have the nature of the wars is changing so much with high-tech war, with an emphasis on the drone wars, an emphasis on special operations forces. We're not talking sending 100,000, 150,000 troops to Iraq, to Afghanistan. We're talking about maybe there'll be 30, maybe there'll be 50, maybe there'll be 5,000, but the numbers are tiny. And one aspect of that is there are almost no U.S. casualties. Now, that's a good thing that there's no U.S. casualties, but it means that the casualties that are rising, whether in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, we don't hear about those. So when the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan testified in Congress just not very long ago, he said, after 15 years of war, well, that wasn't his introduction, that's my introduction, but he said, right now, today, the Taliban controls more land than in any time in history since the U.S. invasion of 2001. And he went on to say that the big issue that the U.S. has claimed, but at least the kids are in school, at least girls are getting an education. Well, it turns out that's not true. 42% of Afghan children, boys and girls, are either never been in school or they've already dropped out of school because the school can't teach them. I think that some of the reasons of why candidates don't talk about this issue is because some candidates are basing their, their campaigns on funding from the people who profit from wars. You know, this notion nobody wants war, simply not true. It is a huge moneymaker in this country. The, the war profiteers, and we should know, war profiteering used to be illegal in the United States. Now it's not only legal, it's sort of encouraged, you know. And it's not surprising. If you look at the year after the 9-11 attacks, the CEOs of all corporations were doing pretty damn well. And their salaries, their multi-million dollar salaries, rose 7% that year. The CEOs of the war companies, the companies that produce bombs and, and planes and warplanes and submarines and all those things, their salaries rose 200 percent. So that's one reason why some candidates don't talk about it. Other candidates, frankly, what we're looking at now is one candidate, Hillary Clinton, who probably has more direct foreign policy experience than any of the others, because besides being a senator, besides being first lady, she was secretary of state. She was the main cheerleader in the Obama administration for the intervention in Libya. Somehow she's not talking about Libya very much, but she's talking about all her experience. But she doesn't have examples to point to of what is succeeding, what has worked. She says, well, the negotiations about discussions with Iran started under my watch. But she opposed them all the way. You know, they didn't happen until she was out. So that's a problem. If you have other people whose views, Bernie Sanders is a candidate who took a very strong position against the war in Iraq in 2002, 2003, his speech on the floor of the House when he opposed when, when he voted against authorizing war in Iraq, was one of the most amazing speeches of the time because he talked about the impact on women and children in Iraq, which is almost unprecedented in, in the halls of Congress. But he doesn't talk about it much now because it's not his strong suit. It's what he's running on is something else. He's running on an extraordinary position focused on the issue of inequality and breaking up the banks. So he's not talking about it. Some of the companies that, that are producing the war machine are advertising all over the place. And the media knows they have to depend on that kind of advertising. The irony, of course, 
you know, when I see ads for Boeing or I see ads for McDonnell Douglas or for Raytheon, I'm thinking, what are they advertising for? I can't go out and buy an F-16. Why are they advertising at all? Full page ads in the Washington Post, big posters on the Washington Metro system. They are advertising with an audience of about 35. The staff and members of the Congressional and Senate Armed Services Committee. That's who those, arms are, those advertising uh, campaigns are aimed at. They're not aimed at you and me. They're aimed at the people who are going to make the decision, not about whether we should go to war, but which war machines we should buy. Should we buy an F-16 or an F-32? Should we put more money into building new submarines or more money into modernizing the nuclear weapons? Those are the only debates that are going on. The media is hugely important in this arena. If media, mainstream media people, the corporate media who depend on these warmongers, if they began asking candidates, why do you think we should be continuing a war policy that has failed for 15 years? We've been at war against terrorism for 15 years, and it's left us worse off than before. Shouldn't we do something different? It would change the discourse.